Amen. Amen. God bless the United States of America. God bless every nation under the planet of the earth. But God has placed a special blessing on this country. It's prophetic. God raised it up and has and a, a special purpose for it. So God bless. And how fitting. You know, we just celebrated a couple of days ago our Independence Day. But how fitting this song also uh, with the current events uh, here in Texas. Talking about the events on Thursday evening in Dallas, Texas. Friends, this, these are just other signs that we are living at the end of times. These are just other signs that men's hearts are full of evil and hate. That men and women will run for fear. And this world is not going to get any better. No. But among that, I do want to, I do want to thank. I have thanked before, but even, even more now for those men and women who put their lives on the line every day Amen. for our safety. Did you know that according to Romans 13, you are ministers for God? According to Romans 13, those that work for the government, those that work, that, that bear the sword, as Paul says, do not bear it in vain, for they are ministers of God doing God's work. So I know that we have officers that belong to this church. I, I think of Pat Jones, I think of Kenneth Cooper, I think of Robert Severance, I think of Cara Westcott. There are, and if there is someone that I've missed, I ap apologize, but I do, I do want to thank you for your service. And may God bless you and every single person out there who puts their life on the line for our safety. Yes. For our safety. God bless you. And God bless the families of those that right now are hurting and suffering. That we may pray that God will give them the peace that they need. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the freedoms of this country that we have for the liberty that we have. But with that liberty, we know that we have people with evil thoughts to do evil things. And so Lord, help us as we live in this world where there is evil, but also we know that your Holy Spirit abides and is moving among. Continue to bless this country, Lord, as you have in the past. Thank you, Father, for, your, for hearing our prayers and help us now as we get into your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sorry. Acts chapter 19 is where we will go today. Acts chapter 19 and this entire well, not in, yes, yes, this entire message is based on verse 2. It's based on verse 2. We may get out early today. We may. I didn't say we, we may. This is, this is a, a short message, but friends... It will cut your heart because it cut my heart. And it is still cutting my heart. Because I know myself. And here, Acts chapter 19, verse 2, Paul mentions, it's Paul asks, Paul says to these disciples, and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And this is the question for today. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you, have we received 
the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit, about the deceptions also of Satan to counterfeit the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about how speaking in tongues and how the devil can counterfeit that. But today I want to talk to you about a deception in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We've talked you know, we've talked a good, a good while of the, about the deceptions out there that Satan does and portrays in other religions or denominations. But this morning I want to talk to you about a deception that exists in our church today. In the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And that deception is the following. And it has to deal with these questions. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit? You see, we tend to feel that if we have truth, we have salvation. We, as Seventh-day Adventists, tend to feel that if we have truth, we have salvation. There is safety and, and sense of security because we can quote scripture, because we can answer the Bible verses, we can answer the, the questions, the hard questions that people may have. But when we get to that point, to knowing scripture so well and so good and can answer and debate any theological topic, we've only reached the level of the Pharisees. Full of scripture. Full of scripture. But the question is, are we baptized with the Holy Spirit? Do we have the Holy Spirit? Because the word without the Holy Spirit is, is insufficient. The Word of God without the Holy Spirit is insufficient. It's not going to be enough. Because truth gives us information, but even the Word of God without the power of the Holy Spirit is insufficient. Without, without the Holy Spirit in our lives doing and moving and and interacting in our lives just having information is not enough I want you to take out your bulletin and look at the first paragraph there in the meditation this is my longest meditation that I've put that I can remember but I could not cut it short <clears throat> they're taken from, re from Review and Herald January 17, 1893 Sister White, the testimony of Jesus says, Without the Holy Spirit, without the breath of God, there is torpidity in conscience, loss of spiritual life. Many who are without spiritual life have their names on the church records, but they are not written in the Lamb's book of life. Wow. Did you just read that with me? You see, Sonia today... Her names are put into the Seventh-day Adventist Church today. But her name was written in the book of life before today. Yes. Amen. When she gave her heart to Christ. But here, there can be many who are without the spiritual life, have their names on the church records, but they are not written in the Lamb's book of life. They may be joined to the church, but they are not united to the Lord. How can that be? Unless there is genuine conversion of the soul to God. Unless the vital breath of God quickens. Notice that. Unless the vital breath of God. What is that? That's the Holy Spirit. The vital breath of God quickens the soul to spiritual life. Unless the professors of truth are, are actuated by heaven born principle they are not born of the incorruptible seed which liveth and abides forever unless they trust in the righteousness of Christ as their only security notice they trust in the righteousness of Christ as their only security not in their knowledge of scripture but in the righteousness of Christ as their own security, unless they copy his character, labor in his spirit, they are naked. They have not, they have not on the robe of 
his righteousness. So my concern is that we are sitting here filled with truth. And there is nothing wrong with truth. We need truth. Praise the Lord for truth. The Bible says the truth will set you free. It will set you free. We are si sitting here filled with truth, but we can be dead as a doornail. Spiritually dead. We've, we haven't been filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's a danger on relying on the Word of God, but divorcing ourselves from the Spirit of God. Trusting on our knowledge for salvation while not having spiritual power will not bring salvation. Trusting on our knowledge of how we can explain the 28 fundamental beliefs, explain the prophecies of Daniel, of Revelation, trusting on that for our salvation without the Holy Spirit will not bring salvation. We're going to see why here with some examples in Scripture. But I want you to look at now the second paragraph of the meditation. Okay? There where it begins, the dead. Are you there? The dead are what? Good. The dead are often made to pass for the living. What is that? What is the title of this sermon? <laughs> the walking dead. Are we, are we the walking dead? Or are we filled that we are living with the Holy Spirit? The dead are often made to pass for the living. For those who are working out what they term salvation after their own ideas have not God working in them to will and to do of his good pleasure. Notice the next sentence there. There is so little real what? Vitality in the church at the present time. Have mercy. When was this written? 1893. And in 1893, God tells us through his prophet that there is little real vitality in the church at the present time. What would she say today in 2016? There is so little real vitality in the church at the present time that it takes constant labor to give men the appearance of life to the professed people of God. When the converting power of God comes upon the people, it will be manifest by what? Activity. That's a whole different sermon. When the Holy Spirit fills your heart, people will know because you serve. Because you serve. They will not, and praise the Lord for this next sentence. They will not be dependent upon their ministers for their life and experience but will realize that Christ is the chief shepherd of the flock. Don't follow any pastor, any preacher, but follow Jesus, the real shepherd of your life, the real shepherd of the flock, the real shepherd of the church. They will not think that their ministers are appointed of God to do their work for them. I've heard that before. They will understand that they must work out their own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it is God that works in them to will and to do of his good pleasure, friends. It is a Holy Spirit that needs to be inside you and inside me. And I want... I want, to, I want you to ask yourself. I want you to ask yourself. Are you getting better? As a Christian. As a Christian person. Are you getting better? Are you the same Christian today that you were maybe a year ago? Or are you spiritually stronger? Are you a better Christian? A holier person? Or are you the same person that is still struggling with the same sins today than 10 years ago or 15 years ago when you were still a Christian? 
You see, the only reason why if we are not growing, friends, spiritually, is because we lack the power of the Holy Spirit. We have all the information, but why haven't we improved? We have truth. But why haven't we improved? Do we have God's message for a happy home, to have a, a, a uh, happy home? Sure we do. God has given us messages through Advent home, child guidance, on how to have a happy home. But then why then are those spouses getting separated and getting divorced? You see, information isn't enough. Do we have God's truth on raising our ch children? Absolutely. We have principles in child guidance that, that if we were to really study it and take to heart, we would be raising our children much different. Much, much different. Do we have, do we have God's methods and truth for, for living healthy? No? Absolutely we do. We do. The health message, ministry of healing. So then why are we, notice I said we, so then why are we still struggling with high cholesterol, with obesity, with overweight? Why? This, this here is not normal. Amen. Because having the truth and information isn't enough, obviously. It's not enough. Truth is not enough without the work of the Holy Spirit to work out that truth. Without the Spirit, without the Spirit to put truth into action, knowledge of truth is nothing. Knowledge of truth is nothing. And I'm going to make a statement that Please believe me when I say that it is not in any way to offend anybody. But the Seventh-day Adventist Church knows and understands the Bible with a depth that surpasses any, any or most other religions or denominations. The Seventh-day Adventist Church knows and understands the Bible with such a depth that surpasses most, if not all, religions, organizations. They may not agree with our interpretation, but they cannot disprove what we teach. Okay, it, this, 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 this is not to hurt someone's feelings. No, 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 no. They may not agree with our interpretation, but they cannot disprove of what we teach what is in Scripture. The average Seventh-day Adventist has a biblical knowledge even that surpasses most Christians. And that is, that is, di that is diminishing, unfortunately, because less Seventh-day Adventists are studying the Bible. I am so... Never mind. Bible knowledge can bring, you see, the, the danger with that is that Bible knowledge and, and wanting to, 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 and knowing, I should say, knowing that, that we can interpret and, and understand the Bible, it can bring arrogance and, and, and even pridefulness. And if we let it, but the worst thing is that biblical knowledge can make a person feel that they don't need anything else. That they don't need anything else. That just knowledge and information is all I, know, is all I need. I can interpret the 2300 days. I can interpret the feast days. I can understand revelation. And feeling that that's all I need for salvation. There is danger in that. Danger in that. You know why? Who, is the, who was the best preacher that walked on this earth? Jesus. Jesus Christ. And he had 12 disciples that were with him 24 hours a day. They heard the sermons literally out of his mouth. They ate with him. They slept with him. They talked with him. They were there. The 12 disciples were with the best preacher 
They got the message right out of the mouth of Jesus. They didn't have to read it how you and I have to read it. They got it right, and they could even ask Jesus, what do you mean by this? Can you, can, can you explain what you just said? And Jesus would easily explain. Yet, what happened? In the crisis, they bailed out. They failed spiritually. They failed spiritually. You see, they didn't have to read about Jesus raising Lazarus. They were there to witness it. They didn't have to read about Jesus walking on water. Peter walked with Jesus on water. They were exposed to the word of God. But after three and a half years with Jesus, they failed spiritually. In the crisis, they bailed out. They were with Jesus, but the Spirit of God was not in them. They were with Jesus, but the Spirit of God was not in them. And, and in the crisis, friends, in these last days, we cannot afford to fail spiritually. You want to live? You want to go to heaven? You want to be ready when Jesus comes? We cannot afford to fail spiritually and bail out on Jesus during the crisis time. I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. You see, there is no power in God's words without God's Holy Spirit. There is no power in God's word without the Spirit being involved. And we can see that there in Genesis chapter 1 in the creation story. In the creation story. Even before in verse even before in verse 3 where it says, Then God said, Let there be light before God's word. Notice what it says. Verse 1 and 2. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. The spirit of God was moving first. And God said what? Let there be light, and there was light. And there was light. There is no power of God without the Holy Spirit being involved. God and God work together. God and God work together. The perfect example will be if you join me in the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37. Here we have a vision that God gave to Ezekiel regarding his church, regarding us. It's the, it's the vision of the dry bones that come to life. Ezekiel chapter 37. Friends, I want you to leave today knowing that if you do not have or not filled with the Holy Spirit, that you may feel naked. Because we need the filling of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel chapter 37 verse 1 and 2. It says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley and it was full of what? Full of bones. Then he called me to pass by them all around and behold, there were many, there, there were very many in the open valley and indeed they were not just dry but very dry very dry and these these bones represent the church how do i know that verse 11 tells us verse 11 tells us then he said to me son of man these bones are the whole house of israel so they represent the church the church is not just dry but what very dry very dry. So then in verse 3 and 4, God tells Ezekiel, And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answer, O Lord, you know. Again he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So what is Ezekiel doing to these bones? He's preaching to them. He's prophesying to them. He's giving them what? The word of God. 
He's giving them the word of God. And do the bones come to life? Notice in verse, in verse 7 and 8. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them and the skins covered them over. But there was no breath in them. So did, was it sufficient to just preach to them? Was the word of God sufficient? No. Did it do something? Yes. Yeah. It, brought, it began to, to, to bring the bones together, began to, to cover it with muscle, to cover it with skin. But yet there was still no what? No life. There was still no life in it. It would be as if there was just a walking dead person. The word of God does have effect. The word of God did do something. It shaped them. It shaped them up. But there was no life. They look good from the outside. From, from the surface. But there was no what? No breath of life. There was no spirit. Just laying there but no power in them. The word, of, the word of God, friends, can do much for us. It can do a lot for us. It can shape us up. It can make us look good. But we can still be without the breath of life. That's what in, in, that's what in verse 9 and 10, there in Ezekiel. Then he said to me, prophesy to the... Breath prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied and he command, as he commanded me, and breathed, and breath came into them, and they lived, and stood upon their feet an exceedingly great army. See, I can preach to you seven days a week. You can study the Word of God seven days a week. But without the Spirit of God in your life, there is no life. You have no life. That is why people, we can, there can be many people who know the Bible in and out. Even in the original language can interpret the Hebrew and the Greek and, and they know exactly what it means. But they shun the Spirit of God. And it does them no good to only know and interpret the written word. But they need the Spirit in them. The Spirit of God in them. This is a, a perfect example of the Pharisees. They knew the word perfect. Perfect. They knew, they knew from Genesis to Deuteronomy by memory. Try to beat that. But yet, what did they do to the Messiah? They nailed him to the cross and crucified him. Spit in his face. Beat him up. And so, there is a danger in only wanting to... to to be a, a person that looks for good sermons, and there is nothing wrong with good sermons. But some people just look for good sermons and they take home a good sermon, or they may tell me that was a good sermon. When in all reality, so what? You heard a good sermon in 3ABN, you heard a good sermon on television, on the radio, or here at church. But did it do anything to your life? Did your life have an effect? Did the Spirit change you? Was it just a good sermon and thank you very much, that was a good sermon. So what? Did it affect your life? Did it change you? The Word informs us, but the Spirit changes us. The Word teaches us, but the Spirit transforms us. 
Amen. The Spirit transforms us. There has, there, ha, there have, there, I have given Bible studies on very, very sensitive topics. Sensitive topics. And I just express what the Bible says. And in my own private time, I said, Lord, only you can make that change. Only you can make that change. And by the grace of God, they make the change. Not because I tell them, you need to make that change if you want to become a member. No. Although I'm thinking that, but I say, Hardy, be quiet. Don't get in the way of the Holy Spirit. And I leave it up to God, and I ask and plead for the Holy Spirit, and I ask them, I ask them, you pray that the Holy Spirit lead you in what to do. And the Holy Spirit changes, transforms people. It is not just about hearing a sermon. After you hear the word of God, you should beg God's Spirit to take that word and transform you and apply it to your life. And apply it to your life. So I want to appeal to you this morning, church. I want to appeal to you this morning. I'm not trying to just try to, to give you a good sermon, but I'm trying for you to be in the kingdom of God. Amen. How many sermons have you heard from me since I've been here? A little, a little bit over 200 sermons from me. Has your character changed since then? Not because of me. No, no, no. Has your character changed? Have you applied what you have heard? And not just from myself, from Pastor Powell, or even before myself, from Pastor, from Pastor Torres. How many sermons have you heard from Pastor Torres? Have any of those applied in your life? Have you seen a change in your life, or are you still the same person in the same rut going over and over. If that's the case, friends, if that's the case, I plead that you pray for the Holy Spirit. Because just information will not be enough when Jesus comes. We need to be filled with His Holy Spirit. Are we filled with just a sermon? Are we filled with just the Sabbath school lesson and that, that we study? Or are we filled with the Spirit to help us apply the sermon, to help us apply the Sabbath school lesson that we study? If we have been in the church for years and our lives haven't changed, friends, something is wrong. What are we doing then? What are we doing? And friends, I said at the beginning that this cuts primarily to me because God preached this sermon first to me and told me, what are you doing, Harley? You were raised in the church. You studied theology. You have the information. Well, what are you doing? What are you doing with it? In our, if our characters haven't improved, we, if our characters haven't improved, if we are not more forgiving or more loving, we are not filled with the Holy Spirit, we may be filled with truth, but lacking the most important thing, and that's the Holy Spirit that applies that truth to our lives. If we are not filled with that, friends, we will miss out in the second coming when Jesus comes. It's that simple. Are we the walking dead or are we, the, are we filled with truth but with no spirit? Friends, it's my desire. Friends, I want to be filled. I want to be filled. I'll be the first one to say that I lack and I need more of the filling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And not just 
I want to be filled, but I want each and every single one of you to be filled. Not just to have the truth and we can explain it and we can, we can show others where they're wrong. So what? But what are we doing with that truth? Is it changing your life? Is it making you a better Christian? Is it making you a better husband? Is it making you a better wife? A better son or daughter? A better student? A better employer? A better boss? What are we doing with the truth that God has given us? Without the Spirit, the truth is, n is insufficient, friends. And so I want the Spirit of God. It's that simple. I want the Spirit of God, and I want you to have the Spirit of God. I want you to have the Spirit of God. Later on, we're going to talk about just how we do that, but how many of us here want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Friends, it's that simple. I did say we may get out early, so we didn't. But friends, I just want you to just contemplate here on the question that Paul asked. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Have you received the Holy Spirit? Or are you just filled with truth but there is no spirit in you? And we become critical like the Pharisees. With all the knowledge of God here, but the Spirit can't do anything with it. It's as simple as asking God and surrendering our lives to His will and His Spirit. If it's your desire to surrender your life to the voice of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to have a, a word of prayer. But before we pray, our closing song is so simple. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me your church here in Cleburne. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you very much for your many blessings and thank you for your Holy Spirit that is here convicting our hearts and leading us to truth. But Lord, thank you very much because we, we know what your word says we can understand and interpret and, and explain the scriptures, but Lord, that is not enough. We need your spirit to apply it to our lives so that our lives may be transformed and changed by your Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, help us to get out of this rut that we are in and to be more victorious in our Christian walk. And that can only happen with the help of your spirit as we let him control our lives. Thank you, Lord, because you hear our prayers. Bless your people here in Cleveland and everywhere around the world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.